Hi guys, I'm Jana with the Anna Community Library and we are here today at the Boise Police Department with Officer Evans who um, is one of the officers who also works with the SWAT team and he is going to be walking us through one of the vehicles that they use in their job called the Bearcat. Hey kids, how are you today? Hopefully you're having fun and you're staying safe. Um, like Jana mentioned, I'm with the Boise Police Department. Uh, right now I work in the Community Outreach Division and also in the additional duty that I have is working with the uh, Boise Police Department SWAT team. One of the tools that we use that helps us mitigate risk, or to use a little bit smaller word, that helps us all be safe, everybody in the community, is called the Bearcat. Um, I'll walk you around it real quick, but just so you know, um, one of the first things, it's bulletproof. It's completely, the whole thing is bulletproof, which keeps us as uh, SWAT officers safe, but also helps us when people are in crisis um, or having a bad day. Um, it helps us be able to get in close and be able to talk with them and hopefully negotiate them uh, to safety as well as keeping us safe. So let's go ahead and take a tour around it. Um, you'll notice that on the sides here we have um, step sides and that's so that all the Boise Police Department SWAT members uh, when we're responding to an emergency call we can stand on the outside and to give you a demonstration of what that looks like we're able to stand on the outside and hold on so that when we do respond and we, we um, arrive on scene we can get off the vehicle quickly and address the situation. Um, we also, you'll notice that we have these big huge tires um, they may even be bigger than some of you, uh, but they are uh, no flats. So if we run over a screw or glass, um, we don't have to worry about getting a, a flat tire, which is always really good. Um, and you kids know what I'm talking about. All of you, I'm sure, or most of you have bicycles. It always stinks to get a flat tire on your bike. So it stinks to get a flat tire on your equipment, so we have no flats. Um, again, you'll notice that we have the step side. It wraps all the way around so all of us can stand on it. There's 20 members of our team and uh, again when we're responding to uh, a call, an emergency call, uh, most of the time we'll be on the outside unless it's cold outside. Everybody likes to be in the cold and riding on the outside of the vehicle when it's raining or snowing. So then we can wrap around here to the inside and you'll notice that we can either keep the do doors open or we can keep them closed. So again if it's really cold outside I'll jump inside here. You'll notice that there's benches inside here that all of us can sit on and uh, close the doors and keep them closed. One of my favorite things on the Bearcat, as you'll notice, they have these little, these little what we call ports, um, which again, help keep us safe. But typically, if you guys were here in person, we could uh, give high fives through here. We could throw candy out to you through there. So multiple different things that we can use those for, but primarily, again, they help keep us safe. Uh, if you keep coming around to the other side, this side's much like the other side. You have your step sides. Again, all, everything's bulletproof. You have additional seats in here. If you kids were here today, one of your favorite things to do, at least in the past, I'll show you, I come inside. is we would lift this up and then we'd open this and then we'd have one of you each at a time stand up here and y'all say hello. So it's super fun and hopefully eventually we'll get to have all of you kids out and actually get a chance to touch it, jump on it, run through it and see what it's all about. So that's the Bearcat. One last thing we'll show you is we'll flip on the lights um, and then we'll call it good. Maybe we can get a little chirp in too. So hopefully you kids are having fun again, like I said. Um, if you have questions, we'll try to answer those. Um, but if you see an officer, or you have questions or you want to say hi, don't hesitate to stop us and say hello. And Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi guys, this is Jana from Ada Community Library. And as you can tell, I am in the back of a police officer's vehicle. Now we're here with Officer Cody. Hi kids. Who's gonna show us a little bit more about this vehicle and walk us through a door. So 
Hi kids, how you doing today? Hopefully you're having a great day. I um, wish you guys could be here in person and we can climb through the vehicle and check it out, press all the buttons. But since you can't be here, I'll walk you through it. So this is one of our police cars. Um, a lot of our police cars now are not cars, but they're SUVs as you can tell. Um, again, like Jenna was saying, this is the place back here where you don't want to be. This is usually people back here are back there because they're having a bad day and unfortunately they've broken the law. Um, just one solid seat. Uh, again, not comfortable at all. And then the bars on the window, because um, it's like being in jail. So, uh, again, not a fun place to be, not comfortable, very hard seat. Here, up here, is where the action happens. A uh, nice comfy chair. Uh, while we're out patrolling the streets, we have a nice computer that uh, dispatch, when you call into 911, uh, they will then in turn send calls to our screen and tell us where we're needed at. We can then type back to them, we can type in notes, we can type reports, um, and respond to our calls, and as you can see, my lights are on, um, and when we respond to big, bad emergency calls, we have to turn our lights on, um, as well as our siren. So, um, if you wanna come join me on the other side, I'll show you all these buttons that we have. Like I said, we have the screen, which is also touch screen, but then we also have the keyboard that we can type. We have a microphone that we can talk to people. So we can talk to them over the microphone if we need to tell them to get out of the road or get out of the street or come out of their house. And then we also have our microphone that we can talk to dispatch with and other officers. Um, in addition to those two, we also have our radio down here that tells us what channel that we're on. Um, and then we have a bunch of different lights that let, let us change, or a bunch of different buttons that let us change the sound of the siren that we're making. Um, also, we can turn on floodlights. So if we need to light up an area that's really dark, we can. We have lights that we can turn on. Um, we also have, if we need to honk at somebody to get their attention, we have buttons for that. And again, like I said, if you were here, I would expect you to be pressing all of those buttons and having fun. Um, there's nothing, oh, we also have these spotlights that we can use. We especially use them at nighttime when we're doing traffic stops, maybe somebody's speeding um, or somebody needs help on the side of the road and, the, and when it's dark outside we can turn these on and they help us to see a little bit better. I want to show you something on the front of the car. So if you've, got, if you've ever seen vehicles stopped on the side of the road and maybe their car broke down or they got a flat tire and they just need help being pushed off the road, what we can use, this is called a push bubble. So it has rubber on the front, so we can actually um, get it right up, touching the car, and we can help push it out of the road. Um, it's also used for, pit, for what's called a pit maneuver. If we have a bad guy um, trying to get away from us, and we need to stop him, we can use these bumpers uh, to make contact with their vehicle to disable that car, to stop it, so that we can take the bad guy and ultimately take it. Um, there's nothing more I can tell you about the police car other than, yes, it is fast, it is fun. Um, but just like you and your parents, you have to drive safe. You as police officers, we have to drive safe. And, and uh, in addition to keeping you safe, we've got to keep ourselves safe so that we can respond and help you when you need help. Hope you guys are having a great day, and talk to you later. Good morning. Uh, Lieutenant Mike Hill, Boise Police Department, Bomb Squad. Uh, so today I'm going to go through some of our uh, equipment that we use uh, on calls that we might be uh, sent to to make things safe for the community to be. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is our main um, robot. This is basically a mechanical version of me. Uh, when we get on a call, if we can use this robot, uh, it can do just about anything that I can do, um, short of you know maybe reading a book or manipulating a small tool. But it can, it can move. It's got a couple of different arms. Uh, so just like my arms, it can uh, lift things up and move things around. It's got eyes, just like I have. It's got a series of five cameras on it. One here, one on the claw there, a backup camera, a drive camera up front so I can see where I'm going, and then a, a camera over here that helps us uh, do some targeting. Um, it can actually talk, my voice, through this speaker right here. Uh, and it can actually listen to what's going on in its environment with this microphone. So what I'm gonna do now is show you, we have to run this remotely, right? We don't wanna be right on top of it. 
So we run it from inside of this trailer over here. And we're gonna go in there real fast and take a look at what the pictures look like when I'm moving the robot. So this is the control station for the robot. This is a joystick, just like you'd see in a regular video game. And when I push the joystick forward, you can see on the camera there that the robot moves forward. When I push it backward, it moves backwards. When I talked about eyes, remember I talked about five cameras. Right now we're on that surveillance camera, the tall one. But I can move it around. This is what I look at when I'm uh, driving the vehicle forward. There's the reverse camera, things like that. Um, and I'm going to unplug this and take it back out and I'll show you how the arms move. How the arms move on this camera, actually, let's take a look at the hand real fast down here by the, uh, where the toolbox is. Um, I can open and close that. Just like your hand, right? It's got a wrist on it so that I can rotate things around if I need to, turn them upside down. And it also has the ability to reach out and pull things back. And I talked about shoulders, arms, and elbows. I wanted to reach out further. Or set this toolbox down. I can go ahead and do that. Using the arms just like you have. And we got to be really careful with some of the stuff we move, so we don't want to drop it. But essentially that's how that works. So that is a mechanical version of me, right? And so the only thing that kind of limits us with regard to using this tool is it's pretty big. And some of the areas that we have to go into are pretty small. So if it's too small to get the robot in, then myself or one of the other bomb techs on the police department has to put this big suit on. This is a bomb protective suit uh, that we currently field in Boise. We have, uh, I believe, six of these right now, one for each tech. Uh, the suit is to protect us from the blast and thermal and pressure energy that comes off of an explosion if it were to happen while we were down uh, in, in the area where that occurred. So it weighs about 85 pounds, so it's significantly heavier than just standing here like I am now. Uh, it's got a nice stout helmet on it, a very thick face shield, but I can see out of it really well. And it's made of armor, right? You can hear that? Nice hard armor so that anything that comes off of the explosion doesn't go through my body or into my body and through it. Uh, it's hot, it's got a fan on it, but it doesn't do a very good job. So we try to spend as little amount of time in the suit as we can so that we can function uh, more efficiently, right? And again, if we can't get the robot in, we gotta put the suit on. But on almost all of our cars, calls, at some point we're going to have to put this bomb suit on because we have to put human eyes on things and not just robot eyes. So some of the things that we might get called out to uh, are closed boxes like this one over here. Somebody might say that this is maybe suspicious and I can't see through the metal of this can so uh, I want to be able to uh, look in there to see what it is to see if it's dangerous so I use an x-ray. This is an x-ray generator, just like uh, is at your dentist office when you get your teeth x-rayed before you get them cleaned. What this does is shoots some very uh, high energy particles or waves out of the generator through the package and into this uh, piece of film right here that we develop using a computer. And it creates an image for us on the hard portions of the things that are in this can, just like this image right here. Can you get on that? Get on that? Mm -hmm. So this is an x-ray image of a gas can and a thermos with a level of water in it and some other articles. So when we look at this, we're looking for some threatening things that might create an explosion or a hazard to us. And then we have to figure out what kind of tool we're going to use to make it safe. Right? This is just a standard picture. One of the tools that we use to make things safe is called a disruptor. And this is a disruptor right here. What this is, is basically a tube that we put our own explosives in and we can shoot a variety of materials out of. One of the most common that we shoot out is water. 
Water is very powerful. It's heavy. It doesn't compress. And when you energize it, it does a lot of work for us. And if we were going to shoot something, we just want to take it apart. We're not sure what's in it. Uh, we just want to separate components so that we can make it safe. And in this case, we've got a flashlight with an unfortunate wire hanging out of it. So we would take some water and we would shoot the flashlight, take it apart, and make what we thought might be dangerous more safe to handle and be around. You ready? So this is our transport trailer. If we had to move something out of an area, we couldn't take an x-ray of it or we couldn't shoot it with our disruptor to make it safe and we had to take it maybe out of town, we would put it in this big steel tube right here and it's open on the top. We take this cover off. We use the arm and the winch to lift the toolbox up that you saw earlier on the robot maybe into this big tube. And this tube is made of very thick metal and it's very solid on the bottom. So if something were to happen and there was an explosion in the tube, everything would go straight up in the air, which is generally the safest place, right? We don't stand around hovering above things, we stand on the ground. Nothing's gonna come out of the side of the tube because it's very, very thick and strong metal. So this is what we use to move hazards away from things so that we might be able to diagnose and take care of things uh, in a more safe way. Hey everyone, my name's Conrad. I work for Republic Services and today is a special virtual touch a truck visit. So thank you for joining us. We have a garbage truck live off the streets. We stop. Uh, Casey Driver, we'll, we'll say hi to him in a little bit, but he was kind enough to stop his truck middle of the route and, and let us virtually see this truck. And uh, what you're looking at here is probably the best part of the whole thing. It's the claw. Uh, it's, it's the thing that comes out and grabs your trash cart or if it's recycled truck, you grab your recycle cart, but grabs it with these wheels on the side here, pinches around the, like a big bear hug around the cart, and then the arm comes out, up, over the top there into the hopper, dumps all the trash, and then sets it back down again. And then the, the claw opens up like you see it here, so Casey can drive down the next trash, trash cart and uh, do it over again. Um, what you're seeing here is the body, and that's where all the trash goes. So once that fills up, after about 450, 500 stops, Casey heads to the landfill or the transfer station to empty this out. And this whole body lifts up like this. The back hatch opens up, the whole body tips up, and all the trash comes dumping out into one big trash mess. Um, let's see, what else we got? Oh, if there is a trash mess uh, on the street here, we got brooms and shovels to clean it up and keep, help keep things looking nice. This would be the cab. This is actually the passenger side of the truck. Uh, when we're driving through neighborhoods, we want to be on this side because it's a little safer, closer to the curb. We can see the carts a little easier and see, uh, see things happening. But when Casey's going fast, he's got to be on the other side of the of the truck and drive from that steering wheel, the normal side, and that's just regular safety stuff. But yeah, we have two steering wheels in here, and see this big joystick. I don't know if you can see that from there, but that big video game joystick that controls this claw, and so it's kind of like a video game. Uh, he's got cameras up there. The truck's not running so you can hear me, uh, but when the truck's running the camera's up there and that way he can see uh, people that come in behind him, cars that come in behind him and can be safe when he's operating around obstacles like that. It looks like we're getting that turned on. Oh, there we go. You want to see the board? Sure. One of the cameras right there has got one in the back and a couple on the other side. So let's take a look at the other side. Alright, so 
this is this side's a little different it doesn't have the claw because he only picks up trash on that side but there are there is a ladder here and a door up there and a hatch right here and so as trash is going in there's a blade that's squishing all the trash and making room so he can get to as many houses as possible <clears throat> well when he does that trash falls down behind that blade and it kind of jams things up from time to time so this way he's able to climb in there or reach his hand in here and clean it out so it all starts operating smoothly again uh, that's about it um, you can see the other steering wheel on this side nice big comfy chair is a camera angle of the blade that Conrad talked about that squishes all of the stuff that the garbage truck picks up so that they fit in as much as possible before they have to go dump the truck. You can see it comes and squishes the truck. At the Boise Transfer Station and we have found our driver Casey. The same driver that we had on the streets, he is full and he's here at the transfer station to, fill, to empty so he can go back out on the street. So he, we're going to watch him back in. And just like I was explaining in the beginning, he's going to open that back and tip the whole body up. Conrad again and this was part two of our virtual touch of truck visit we're at the Boise transfer station I tried to talk over the noise I'm not sure if you could hear me or not but basically we found Casey he was done with this trash route uh, well not done with it but he was full from this trash route and it had 450 to 500 stops to fill that truck up and that's the truck we saw unload 
So when he first opened the back hatch, a little bit fell out, and you're thinking, wow, that's a lot. But then he pulls away, and all the rest, about 20 cubic yards of compacted trash came out of there. And that's what you saw. So what happens after that is you saw the, the orange or yellow loader pushing the garbage towards the wall. And what, uh, what they're doing is dropping it down into a uh, kind of a tunnel. And it goes into a semi-truck just like this one here. And when that semi-truck is full, it goes up to a landfill. And so we're basically transferring trash. And that's why it gets the same transfer station. We, we transfer trash here and just take it up in one load. Uh, in semi-loads, just have a bunch of garbage trucks. And behind me, we have a little bit of recycling going on for uh, tree trimmings and, and yard waste debris. And that will not be landfilled. That will be repurposed and uh, chipped up and mulched and used in cattle bed. So I think our next stop is the recycling facility. Uh, Casey's a, a garbage truck driver and they don't go to the recycling facility, so we won't see him again, but uh, we're gonna see more cool stuff on stop number three. all that and when he's full he or she's full he comes here to dump the recycling we have one dumping right now on the far side there and you can see how much recycling is, is coming here and think of all that not going landfill so you guys are doing your job and we appreciate that what i have here on both sides of me are the finished product of the sorting so it goes we got a video earlier, but it's too loud to talk through it. And anyway, you put all of your recycling into the recycle cart as one. Cans, paper, plastic, cardboard. But it all has to get separated out. And that's what happens here. And what's behind me is the end result. So we have piles of cardboard and paper bailed together. And all these will end up back at a paper mill to be reused as paper or cardboard. And then there's other bales just like these that are just cans or just plastic. And they will go to other end users that will make new stuff out of it. So this is how the recycling process works. It, it doesn't just stop at your curb, it starts there. So thank you very much for recycling and thank you for being part of this virtual touch truck. Hey guys, this is Jana with Ada Community Libraries Virtual Touch Truck. We are at Gowan Field today to take a look at some of the different vehicles out this way. Right now, we're getting ready to watch um, this tank. We're going to turn the top half of the gun around. We're going to take a look.
Touch and Truck, Staff Sergeant Strassel. Uh, I'm one of the instructors here out in Gallonfield, Idaho. And behind me is an M1A2 SEP V2 tank. It's one of the, uh, it's currently the U.S. Army's main tank. We teach courses here. We teach everything from the basic, like how to start the tank and drive it around to a bit of maintenance and even higher level command for uh, more skilled soldiers. It has a crew of four on the vehicle. There's a driver who's by themselves in the front of the vehicle and everybody else inside the turret. You have a loader who's responsible for putting the ammunition into the big 120 millimeter cannon that's about five inches. Uh, then there's a gunner whose main job is to point the cannon at targets and use the uh, machine gun that's mounted by the side. He's the main, his main job is fighting enemies on the tank. And then finally have the tank commander who sort of works like the brain of the vehicle. He watches out for targets, he talks on the radios to other tanks to coordinate, make sure everybody's in the right place. And he also keeps everybody else on the tank coordinated so that the, the tank can fight very effectively. The Abrams is a pretty heavy tank. It has a lot of very thick armor on it. It weighs about 70 tons, which is quite a lot. Though despite that, it's pretty quick. It can get up to about 40 miles an hour on a good surface because it has a very strong engine on it. It's actually a turbine engine, so it's kind of like what you use in a helicopters, but it's fitted on a tank. It provides a lot of power. It actually makes the tank pretty quiet. You'd be surprised how close this thing can get to you before you can hear it. Alright, now we're standing on the top of the tank, looking at towards the back of the turret. This vehicle is famous in Desert Storm for being able to kill its targets in a single hit. The reason for that is, the enemy tanks it was fighting store all their ammunition inside the vehicle, so if it gets hit, the entire vehicle explodes. Something that's special about the Abrams is all that most of the ammunition is stored at the back of the turret. So if the tank takes a very dangerous hit, the explosion goes away from the vehicle instead of destroying the tank and killing everybody inside the vehicle. Alright, so because the Abrams uses a cannon that's loaded by a person instead of a machine, the Army uh, builds and issues dummy ammunition so the loader can practice loading the cannon. This one here is the main uh, tank's main round. We call it Sabo. It's an armor-piercing round. It looks kind of like a giant arrow when it fires. The plug around it, which is Sabo, which is called uh, what gives it its name, falls away and then the big dart flies towards the target. So it's very fast and it's very good at punching through things. Kind of like imagine sort of like a, um, a syringe needle that you use to get a shot. It's very narrow, easily passes through things. So the saber round is very good at feeding very heavily armored targets. To deal with lightly armored targets and bunkers and things like that, buildings, etc., we use what's called the heat round, high explosive anti-tank. This is an explosive round, but it's specially designed so when it hits, most of the energy goes, instead of spreading out like a grenade, it goes in one direction into what it hits. It's very good at defeating light armored vehicles. An improved version of that is called Impact. It's much faster, it's very similar to the heat round, but it has a special feature. In the nose of the round, there's a proximity fuse that can detect if it flew past a target, so it can be used against aircraft as well. And then finally, you have the canister round. This is the one everybody thinks is really cool because it's like a cannon-sized shotgun round. When it fires, it breaks apart. About a thousand pellets scatter an area a few hundred meters wide, so several football fields. Very dangerous against any enemy infantry. It can also be used to attack targets in buildings as well. I'm a instructor here, or a teacher, um, at the FIRSA 204th RTI, and I'd like to talk to you about the Bradley Fighting Vehicle. Um, I actually get to train soldiers on how to use this piece of equipment. So, um, looks kind of like a big, um, a big bus, and that's what we use it for. So, down here on the bottom, the hull portion, and then you have the turret up there where the gun is sticking out. Um, in the hull, you have the driver and um, up to seven passengers. And then in the turret itself, you've got on this side over here, of the turret, you have the commander who gives all the commands for the vehicle. And on the other side, up on top where that big box is sticking, right behind that is where the gunner sits. So you can actually have up to 10 people in this vehicle. Um, a few of the features are it, unlike a tank that drives from the rear, it drives from the front, and the engine compartment is right here. This is where the big engine 
So it's kind of it's kind of a, a little bit different than what we're used to. Uh, in the turret, you've got your 25 millimeter automatic cannon, um, a tow missile launcher, and a machine gun, and that's what that's what this vehicle has for weapon systems. Uh, as we come around, the driver kind of all up here all by himself. That's he, he's he's the farthest away from the rest of the crew, um, and he sits right next to the engine, so it's really noisy. So we use our helmets to be able to communicate between uh, the different crew members inside. Um, we have up to seven people, so up to seven soldiers can sit inside here and be transported across the battlefield. So they have this they have this great big ramp that comes down and a little tiny a little tiny crew hatch. Um, which they also have ports in them so that they can fire the weapons from inside the vehicle to outside the vehicle. This little gadget up here, this whole piece right here is the commander's remote control camera. So he can watch one part of the battlefield while the gunner on the other side of the turret can also see another part of the battlefield. And that pretty much sums up the Bradley A3 fighting, uh, infantry fighting piece. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Lieutenant Corey with Idaho Army National Guard. Today, we're gonna to go ahead and show you the Alphaline Blackhawk. All right, so we're here in the cockpit of the UH-60 Blackhawk. So there's two seats, one for each pilot. Each pilot has a set of flight controls. Here in the center, this is called the Cyclic, and this helps you uh, control uh, the helicopter as you're flying it around. This is kind of like the gas pedal. It's called the Collective, it goes up and down. And down here at my feet, are two pedals which help you control the heading of the helicopter and help you move back and forth. Uh, while, and while you're flying around, you use these instruments that are right in front of you here to fly it. So these allow you to do everything um, from fly the helicopter in the clouds, uh, just help understand where you're hovering around on the ground, uh, shows your altimeter, um, your vertical speed, which shows you how fast you're going up or down. Uh, this is called your HSI, which allows you to tell you which direction you're going. And then all these instruments in the center, looks kind of complicated, but it shows you your fuel, your transmission pressure, your oil pressure, all the things that are gonna let you know how well your engines are functioning. Other than that, when you look down here, this is where you got a lot going on, but you have your, uh, your GPS, you have different radios, so you can monitor different frequencies, talk to different people, and allows you to uh, communicate um, both with the tower and with other helicopters. You have a transponder, which lets uh, the air traffic controller um, know who they're talking to. And then you have a whole bunch of other stuff down here which allows us to um, load different flight plans. So now they are showing you the cockpit of the Black Hawk, we're gonna go ahead and show you the, uh, the cabin area. So right behind the pilots, there's two seats and this is where our crew chief seat sit. So this whole uh, seating area allows them to look out, help us clear our tail when we're moving back and forth because we have a whole bunch of aircraft behind the pilots that we can't see the whole time. They sit back here, they can use this right here which is our hoist. So that moves up, up uh, back and forth and up and down. So they have a little control head, which allows them to pick people up and down. And that kind of brings us to the missions of the Black Hawk. So as part of the National Guard, we have two missions, uh, primary missions that we help uh, serve. So you have the military mission, which is where we move troops around. We do air assaults. Uh, we pick up cargo and move it around the battlefield uh, and a whole myriad of other things. The great part about the Black Hawk is it can fill multiple roles. We also have a civilian mission where we support uh, the state of Idaho. We do everything from firefighting, uh, we help move passengers around, and basically complete most of the missions that the governor would like us to do. So when you look in the cabin here, you have a pretty big open area, and usually this is filled with seats. So you can have up to 11 uh, infantrymen that sit here, and they have all seats that's both facing forward and backwards, and that's with them wearing all their gear. Uh, you can fit 11 people in here and go and place them wherever you need to uh, and move them around very quickly. And that's the great part about the helicopter. Also, we also have the ability to use a, ho a hook that is down here in the bottom of the helicopter. And this allows us to pick up different equipment, move it around. Uh, you have um, up to 8,000 pounds that you can put on the hook uh, when you're just flying around regularly. Uh, and it allows you us to pick up Humvees, uh, food, and different equipment. It's pretty great. Moving further back, close the door here. 
can show you a couple other cool parts of the helicopter. So all of this is where you have your tail rotor drive shaft. Here's the exhaust port for the engine right here, which we'll go over here in a minute. Uh, tail rotor drive shaft is contained under this covering right here. And that brings us to the sail rotor, which is a really important part of the helicopter. So obviously when you have the rotor blades moving around, you have a lot of torque. It wants to spin the body of the helicopter. The tail rotor stops it from doing that. So I'll go ahead and climb up here and show you. The tail rotor has four blades, and you can control the pitch of the tail rotor with the pedals that you have up in the cockpit. And so you can see that when you spin this, it'll spin the rotor blades. showing you the bottom part of the helicopter we're going to go and show you the high what we call the hydraulic deck so up here you have um, all your hydraulic controls for the Blackhawk so you have two different hydraulic pumps that are your main pumps and you have a backup pump right here it also holds your generators uh, controls all of your flight controls um, and this is basically with the heart of the helicopter where everything moves all right, and here we have the engines of the Black Hawk. So you have two engines, one on each side, and they're made by General Electric, and each one of these puts out about 1,600 horsepower, uh, give or take, depending on the condition of the engine. And so the way these work is it pulls air in through here, brings it in, heats it up, and then there's an explosion, which is then pushed out the back, and that in turn turns a drive shaft, which comes in to the main transmission, which is right under uh, this swash plate right here. And that will drive the rotor around. Now these engines are extremely powerful and the, the benefit of having two is that if one engine goes out, you can still fly on just one engine alone depending on your airspeed. All right everybody, and that's the UH-60 Blackhawk. Thanks for watching.